<clears throat> All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the good weekend you've given us. Thank you, Father, for the services yesterday and all the good preaching, and, and uh, thank you, Lord, for the souls that were saved over the weekend. We pray your blessings now upon the start of this new week. Father, may we seek you this morning and put you first in all matters of our lives. And Father, I pray that you'll bless this morning in all of our classes, beginning with this one. We pray, Lord, that you'll direct our thoughts this morning as we study the Scripture. Father, help us to focus on, on uh, what we need to accomplish here today. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let me remind you as we get back to our uh, schedule this week, um, your memory work assignment for Wednesday. Wednesday, that'll be next time we meet together. It will be week number nine on your list. Again, a couple of familiar verses, I would think. Matthew 6, 33, and also Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. So uh, be ready to go with that first thing on Wednesday. And uh, according to the calendar, if I figured it right, we've got, uh, of course, this week, and then we're on spring break next week. And the uh, week following that, of course, is Soul Winning Marathon Week. So <clears throat> when we get back, we'll be, of course, into April. And uh, I believe we've got, uh, counting today and counting this week, we've got, uh, I believe, six weeks of, uh, of teaching time left, and then, of course, a week of finals. So, so we're at the halfway point or a little bit beyond that give or take, so, uh, so we're pretty well right on the money where we need to be in relation to our, to our class notes. I do want to remind you of uh, upcoming events and regarding uh, the end of the semester, which is still, like I said, six, seven weeks away, but it'll be here before you can realize it. <clears throat> so be mindful of the fact that your <clears throat> um, two, two major things that, uh, that you need to be focusing on uh, as we uh, get to that point in time, one, of course, will be your final <coughs> workbook assignment, which is book number three, and there's three sections to that one, uh, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, and the doctrine of salvation, and uh, that's not actually due until the 4th of May, but uh, uh, again, like I say, it'll be here before you know it. Also, be mindful of the fact that you're uh, of keeping up with the blessing of typing up your class notes amen how many of you have been doing that all along how many of you haven't typed up the first letter so far okay well we got one or two honest people here anyway but all uh, right seriously that's gonna that's gonna be here now last semester of course class notes were not all that uh, extreme in this particular class because we spent so much time doing uh, doing uh, reviews of dr. Carter's book and so on and so forth this semester, it's all in lecture notes, so you've got more than plenty of things to do there. So, so please stay stay up with that and uh, keep it uh, as current as you can. And it won't be such a uh, it won't be such a burden to you at the end of the semester like it uh, like it could be if you don't uh, if you don't stay current with it. All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> We're into this section now on the uh, doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, I want to deal with the Bible proofs for the Trinity, and we'll, again, uh, examine a few of these. We certainly won't exhaust all of the scriptural truth regarding this subject, but, uh, but we'll give you a, a pretty good foundation in it here, I think, before we're finished. And we're going to start with the New Testament references, and we'll take a look at some of those here this morning, and as time permits, we'll get into the Old Testament as well. As we've already seen, of course, we've, we've been a few days since we've been into this. Last week we had our midterm exam, and I gave you some study time on Friday because I'm such a merciful, loving teacher. And uh, so, so we've got to get back to it here today. But, but it's been a few days since we've been into this. But <clears throat> as we've already seen, the major emphasis, of course, in the Old Testament is on the unity of God. But the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, as we've also seen, of course, and will see here, is clearly shown. And, of course, the Trinity is clearly and explicitly declared in the New Testament. So we're going to deal with the New Testament first. And uh, that's our, uh, and again, I'm going to try to give this to you somewhat in outline form, if I can remember to stay on the outline for you. Roman numeral one, Bible proofs for the Trinity, subpoint A, the New Testament. And then subpoint number one under A, the New Testament plainly teaches the Trinity, teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. So point number one, the New Testament plainly teaches 
the doctrine of the Trinity. And there are numerous Bible references <coughs> and, uh, in, in which the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, of course, are all named. And uh, right here in Matthew chapter 28 is a good place to start off as we get to the passage here at the end of the chapter uh, that deals with uh, what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission, that which the Lord has commissioned the church to do. And uh, the Bible says here in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All right, so here we have <clears throat> the Trinity in verse number 19, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, we are to, of course, uh, endeavor to preach the gospel to every creature, and we are, uh, of course, uh, to endeavor to win them to Christ and to, uh, to get them to be obedient to the Lord uh, in relation to baptism, and then, of course, to teach them, to disciple them. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of Christians are very negligent on all three accounts. Some Christians are pretty good on the winning them part, and praise the Lord for that. But uh, not too many Christians are, are very thorough in the follow-up in relation to getting them baptized and, and getting them, of course, discipled. And I realize there's a free will involved in the individual convert, uh, that they have to have the desire, of course, to go on with that. Brother uh, Strange brought some good points out on that last night in relation to his brother and and some other uh, illustrations that he gave. But uh, I think about it like this. If I go home this afternoon and I tell my son, you know, I've got three things I want you to do before supper time, and I list three chores for him, and he does a magnificent job on number one but doesn't even get to number two or three, then I'll be pleased that he did number one, but I'll be displeased that he didn't even give any attention to number two and three. And, uh, and so... We've got to realize there's a threefold commission there. I didn't really want to get off on that too much, but there it is. So, but uh, here we have the, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all named. Now, those who choose to uh, discount the doctrine of the Trinity, they'll come to a verse like this, and we'll see some other examples of this as well. And, uh, and their, their charge, their argument is that <clears throat> this is not teaching that there is a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit who are all God, who are all co-equal and co-eternal. They just happen to all be mentioned together in the same verse. That's their, uh, that's their answer to that. So for whatever that's worth, let's continue. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Of course, the crowd that rejects the doctrine of the Trinity often reject so many of the other uh, important doctrines of God's Word and, and reject God's Word itself. Um, John chapter 14, here we have the Son, the Lord Jesus, speaking uh, of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. We see that in a couple of locations here, I think, in this chapter alone. This is, of course, the great chapter that begins with those words uh, of the Lord Jesus in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And uh, he's speaking, of course, to his close disciples here. And, of course, these first few verses are such a, uh, a precious portion of Scripture to us. <clears throat> these fellows uh, <clears throat> had troubled hearts, and their hearts were troubled for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons was uh, this, this talk that the Lord had had, had with them about uh, the fact that he would soon be departing from them. And uh, they didn't quite know how to deal with that, didn't quite know how to handle that. And uh, as you know, when the time came, they didn't handle it very well either, did they? At least not in the, in the initial stages of that time. But uh, notice what the scripture says here in verse number uh, 16. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus is speaking here. Let's back up to verse 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Look at verse 16 now. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So here again you have the account of the doctrine of the Trinity in this reference. You have the Lord Jesus, God the Son, speaking and praying to the Father. 
and to God the Father, and of course, God the Holy Spirit is spoken of here as the Comforter. And uh, the Bible, of course, is the best uh, interpreter of itself, isn't it? Uh, and so you say, well, who's the Comforter? Well, look down at verse number 26, and the Lord clearly tells us, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. All right, so here we have the, uh, the Trinity, of course, in verse 16 and again in verse number 26 as the Lord speaks of the Holy Spirit. God the Son is speaking of, of, of God the Holy Spirit and God the Father. All right, now let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And again, I'm just kind of pointing out some, uh, some of the <clears throat> basic references here uh, regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. This portion of Scripture is what is often referred to as the apostolic benediction. You may say something like that in your, in your uh, <laughs> reference notes there, and if you have a study Bible, perhaps. But uh, notice what, the Lord's, uh, what Paul says here as he closes out. Uh, this uh, second letter to the church of Corinth here in the very end of the book in the last verse of chapter 13 we'll pick it up here in verse about uh, number 11 he says finally brethren farewell be perfect be of good comfort in this uh, book of, uh, of Corinthians here of course and 2 Corinthians in particular several times Paul has referred to God as the God of all comfort and uh, he says to them, as he closes out this letter, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. Now look at verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's in reference to the God the Son, and the love of God in reference to God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost, uh, God the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Again, what we often refer to, what often is referred to as the apostolic benediction. You have all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, of course, here in this same account. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Again, I'm just kind of pointing out some of the references here that deal with the doctrine of the Trinity. Ephesians chapter 4. And the reference will be verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Again, a familiar portion of Scripture, I would think, to you uh, in this portion that, that talks about uh, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, and so forth. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. All right, so again, we have reference to the Lord, uh, the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to 1 John, <coughs> excuse me, 1 John chapter 5. Now, this is one that I will require you to know from memory on your, uh, on your t next test. We're going to do one more test, and then before we get to our final, uh, at the end of the semester, we'll do a test uh, <clears throat> over this material on the doctrine of the Trinity in itself. So uh, that'll be coming up after we get back from the break and, and so many marathon and so forth, somewhere along in there. But uh, this reference, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, I want to talk about it for a little bit. I want you to put it into your notes uh, as what I will simply call the classic verse on the Trinity, the classic verse on the doctrine of the Trinity, <clears throat> because it spells it out in no question, no shadow of a doubt whatsoever. That's why the devil hates it so much. That's why uh, many of your modern Bibles do not even have this verse in them. <laughs> uh, some interesting thoughts on that. Some of the so-called uh, uh, experts say, you know, this verse doesn't belong in our Bible. Well, I don't know about you, but it's right there in mine. Amen. That's good enough for me. And, uh, but the idea is this, <clears throat> that uh, many of the uh, uh, modern Bibles, modern perverted Bibles, say that this portion of Scripture were not 
in some of the uh, oldest and so-called better manuscripts that they've studied. Now, we've had that discussion last semester. And uh, why were they, uh, why were those manuscripts the best manuscripts in terms of being in the best shapes? Because God's people had rejected them and, uh, and discarded them as the heresy that they were. It's very interesting, and uh, <clears throat> there's a, a little pamphlet that Dr. Stringer produced. He did several of these on a lot of different subjects. I don't know if they're still available in our bookstore or not, but uh, they can become available. Uh, we just did uh, St. Patrick's Day weekend, and uh, Dr. Stringer wrote an excellent uh, article regarding, uh, regarding that business and who Patrick, so-called St. Patrick, really truly was. And, of course, it's a great distortion of what, what he celebrated as today as to who he really was. If you ever get a chance to pick that up and, and, and read it, uh, you'll find out a lot of good information, find out a lot about truth about a lot of different subjects that he, he has dealt with. But he wrote one pamphlet, <coughs> one little article <coughs> that was entitled In Defense of 1 John 5, 7. And, of course, it gives the manuscript evidence and all that kind of stuff that Dr. Stringer deals with <coughs> regarding why, <coughs> why that verse is in our Bible and why it certainly should be in our Bible, and why God has preserved it in his eternal word, and why there's been such an attack upon it, uh, of course, from the Bible-rejecting crowd. And uh, he, he told us one day, uh, perhaps in chapel, I don't remember now, uh, a few years ago, that he was preaching at a church uh, in the area here, over toward Tampa, I believe, over in that general vicinity. And, of course, uh, as was customary, he had a book table there in the back of the church and had, had uh, you know, some of the books that he had written, the book that he wrote on Baptist history and, and a lot of these other things that he has produced over the years. And one of those there, of course, was that little pamphlet in defense of 1 John 5, 7. And he says there were a number of students, college students, that attended that particular church that he was preaching uh, at that day who were students at a, at a Christian college in the area uh, over that direction. And uh, he said that several of them, uh, they didn't, certainly didn't disagree with him, but, uh, but they mentioned to him there's not a single staff member, faculty member at the college I go to that believes that, that believes 1 John 5, 7 ought to be in our Bible. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure Dr. Stringer was kind. I don't know how kind I would have been. I'd have said, well, I think it's time to be hunting another Christian college then. What do you think? Huh? Maybe start with a Bible college to start with. But... But seriously, that was, the, that was the party line. That was the opinion of those folks. And, uh, you know, that this verse ought not to be in our Bible. Look at what it says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Go ahead and write it out in your notes. As I said, I'm going to require you to have this down from memory come test time anyway. I don't know if it's on your memory verse list, but it will be on the test list. Amen. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Bible goes on and says in verse 8, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. All right, focus primarily on that seventh verse. For there are three that bear witness in earth. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right, so here we have reference, of course, certainly to God the Father, the Word, speaking of the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right, so nail that down, put a star beside it, 1 John 5, 7. I will ask you a couple questions about that come test time, I'm sure. I'll ask you what is the classic verse on the Trinity. And uh, then I'll ask you to quote it as well. Now, there's one other thing I want to mention here. Uh, well, more than one thing, but another thing I want to mention to you in this discussion is uh, this question. What are three events? Put this down. I want you to know all three of these. Again, come test time. Uh, what are three events in the life of Christ? What are three events in the life of Christ that portray the Trinity? Three events in the life of Christ that portray the Trinity. What are three individual times that we see uh, in the Scripture, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in the same account, 
uh, in actual events that took place uh, in the earthly life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what comes to mind? Okay. Uh, baptism is first on my list as well. Each of the Gospels refer to this account. And so there are four parallel passages regarding the baptism of Christ. Let me give you the references here if you want to put them down. Um, and we'll just talk about them. I think we're familiar enough with them that we don't need to turn to each one. But uh, each of the Gospels refer to the baptism of Christ. Matthew and Matthew chapter 3, and I'll just kind of give you the, uh, the verses here. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Also in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. And then in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse uh, 32 through 34. John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. And so in each of those accounts, of course, as you go back and read through them, it's very clear that you have God the Father speaking from heaven. You have the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and, of course, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven. Now, again, as I said a little while ago, and I'll bring it back around and reemphasize it once again, uh, the Bible-rejecting crowd point to these same verses and claim that they in no way prove uh, the deity of Christ or the deity of the Holy Spirit, only that they all three happen to be mentioned together in the same verse. <laughs> well, the truth of the scripture, of course, is that there is a Father who is God, amen? There is a Son who is God, and there is a Holy Spirit who is God. Now, let's insert this before we get to the other two accounts in the life of Christ that I want you to put down. But, uh, and I want you to turn to these. Uh, the Bible is very clear that there is a Father who is God, Romans. And I'll just give you a short list here on verses, but uh, start with that statement. There is a Father who is God. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Now, again, I want you to get this down because uh, come test time, I'm going to ask you to give me this information again with the reference. So get the reference and the statement. First statement, there is a father, underline the word father. There is a father who is God. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Of course, there's many, many verses that speak of God the Father. But uh, here's one. Paul says in Romans 1, 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Peace to from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, again, like I said, you'll find many references in the Scripture that speak of God the Father. All right, secondly, there is a Son who is God. Underline the word Son. There is a Son who is God. <clears throat> and here we'll go to uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 8. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 8. There is a Son who is God. All right, notice what the Scripture says. We're familiar with this first part of this chapter. We've been in it a couple times, I think, even this semester, uh, about how the Lord, uh, of course, speaks unto us in these last days by His Son and so forth. And uh, the whole passage, of course, is, revo is revolving around uh, the, the, the Lord Jesus Himself, the deity of Christ, and uh, the scripture says, and uh, let's back up to verse, uh, uh, let's see, about verse number 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, God the Father uh, doing the speaking here. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, let's get to verse number 8 and listen carefully. But unto the Son, now remember, who's speaking? God the Father is speaking. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, 
is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So here we have God the Father speaking of the Son and calling him God. But unto thee, uh, but unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. All right, so there's just one representative verse, at Hebrews 1, 8. There is a Son who is God. All right, thirdly, there is a Holy Spirit who is God. There is a Holy Spirit who is God. <clears throat> now, if I ask you to give that to me from Scripture, is there a particular episode in Scripture that comes to mind uh, that you would turn to in relation to that particular thought? A little early in the morning to be thinking so uh, deeply, I know. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. This is the episode, of course, of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember how that God killed them because they lied to him. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied to God. All right, that's what we're going to find here in this portion. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. There is a Holy Spirit who is God. This is a, an interesting account in the scripture uh, of these two individuals uh, who, uh, of course, uh, the Lord uh, struck down dead right here in the, in the temple, uh, in the church that day. Uh, the scripture says in Acts chapter 5, verse 1, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and, bar and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I perhaps told you about the teacher I had when I was in high school in my senior year uh, who uh, I had in, in a particular class, and there was a lot of different discussion. Uh, I think I told you about the guy that stood up and quoted the Ten Commandments to him. Did we have that discussion? Okay, I get classes mixed up, but anyway. Um, same same class. This guy came in one day and, and he just said some outrageous things every now and then for shock value and and to, to get people focused on on the subject for the day. But uh, for being a, a so-called devout Catholic, he had some pretty outrageous views. But uh, he came in one morning and he read from the King James Bible this this uh, passage right here, and uh, and and he he talked about how that. Uh, uh, in his opinion, Jesus Christ was the first communist that ever lived. And, uh, and he came back to this passage and, and some similar passages, of course, about the people of the church sharing things in common and so forth. And, of course, that was back in the day. Like I said, it's been a long time ago for most of you, if not all of you, were even born. But uh, when I graduated high school, but that was the time of the, of the hippie revolution and all that kind of stuff. Now, by the time I graduated high school, they still, they still made the guys cut their hair. I mean, the, the hair code at the public high school I went to was just as strict as, as at any Christian school, any, any good Christian school. It makes the guys get their hair cut and look like guys. And I think it was the, the next year or two that the Supreme Court said they couldn't do that anymore, and people started coming to school looking like, like uh, Fido instead of a young man, you know. But anyway, uh, but he, he came in and he talked about all that. And he said, you know, this, this is just uh, proof, even from the Bible, that, uh, that what Karl Marx taught was correct. Now, he didn't necessarily believe all that. He was just throwing it all out there to give people some impetus to get fired up and, and discuss it. And, uh, and so, of course, the defense from the scripture to that, which was discussed that day by other young people in the classroom as well as myself, is that, uh, you know, the communists don't believe in private ownership, do they? And, uh, they, you know, they believe the state owns everything. And so if that was truly the case, these people wouldn't have owned something that they could have sold. <laughs> the state would have already owned it, you know. And uh, so, you know, sometimes you have to kind of look beyond the obvious when people come up with some of that stupid nonsense like that. But look, if you will, here as we get back on task here, the uh, <clears throat> portion is talking about the Holy Spirit, who is God. It says, a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. <clears throat> but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? 
whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Now listen carefully. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. All right, so here we have the reference uh, of lying to the Holy Ghost in verse 3, lying to God in verse 4. And uh, why is that? It's because the Holy Ghost is God. Amen? And uh, now, why did, uh, why did God kill these people? Uh, it was their property to do whatever they pleased to do with it. If they wanted to keep it, if they wanted to, you know, build a 7-Eleven on it or whatever, that was their business. The problem was they lied about it. The problem was that they, dis, that they misrepresented the situation to, to uh, of course, to the apostles and lied to God in the process. And, uh, and that's why God killed them. Look at verse 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Well, boy, I guess so. And uh, the young men arose and wound him up and, and uh, carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in and did the same thing. And the Lord killed her as well, as you know the account here. All right, so Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, there is a Holy Spirit who is God. Okay, so three events in the life of Christ that portray the Trinity. The first one, obviously, is the baptism of Christ. Let's go to with me to uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now, what's going on in Luke chapter 1? <clears throat> the birth of the Savior, amen? All right, Luke chapter 1. You guys need to wake up this morning, I'll tell you what, you're the program here. <clears throat> That's number two on your list, the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation slash birth of Christ. The incarnation birth of Christ. That's the second event in the life of Christ that portrayed the Trinity. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 35 is the reference I want you to put down there. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Of course, here we have the angel appearing to uh, Mary and, uh, and explaining to her what's going to happen and how that uh, she has, uh, you know, been chosen by the Lord. In verse number 28, the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among, among women. And when she saw him, uh, the angel, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth, and, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now I want you to focus primarily on verse 35, and that's the reference you need to put down in your notes. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. All right, so the second event in the life of Christ that portrays the Trinity, that portrays the Trinity, of course, is the, the incarnation, the birth of Christ. Here you have the Holy Ghost coming upon her, God the Holy Ghost. The power of the highest, of course, is in reference to God the Father, and, of course, the Lord Jesus, uh, the Son of God, God the Son, of course, referred to as well. All right, the third uh, event in the life of Christ uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, portraying the Trinity. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. The third one, of course, is the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll look at one verse here on this one. Uh, verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. <clears throat> And again, this is probably a familiar verse to you, I would think. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The scripture says in that 18th verse, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, 
the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Here we have Christ referred to, God the Son, that he might bring us to God. That is in reference to the Father, of course. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And of course, God the Holy Spirit. Quickened, of course, means to be made alive, doesn't it? And so this is in reference, of course, to the resurrection. Uh, the Lord Jesus uh, of course, went to the cross of Calvary. He became the penalty for sin. He bore the sins of the world upon him. And that's what Peter's saying here. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. And uh, what was the purpose of that? It was so that we, as mankind, might be reconciled to God. Now, we, we've been teaching some things on that in another class here in recent uh, sessions. And I'll touch on that again. Reconciliation is for man. It's not for God. God doesn't need to be reconciled to anybody. God is perfect. God is holy. God is just. God has no chinks in his armor, as we would say. Uh, no, man's the problem. Sin's the problem. And uh, sin is a barrier between man and God. So the Lord Jesus came to provide a way for man to be put back into fellowship, to be reconciled back to God. And so... Uh, so that's what this is referring to here, of course, to be brought back uh, to, uh, to God, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, that's the crucifixion, but quickened by the Spirit, that is the resurrection. All right. Now, I also want to expand upon this discussion here for just a little bit as our time you know, starts to kind of wind down on us here in this session, that the attributes of deity, uh, we've touched on this a little bit in some previous discussions, but... Consider this thought, the attributes of deity belong equally to each person of the Godhead. Now, we spent a good part of this, first part of the semester, talking about the attributes of God, the natural attributes and the moral attributes of God. So let's kind of hit that again in a running fashion here. But uh, put that statement down, I'll give you some thoughts regarding it, and uh, this is about as far as we'll get with it here this morning. We've got some more to do with this, but uh, regarding the Old Testament references, but Let's put this statement down. The attributes of deity belong equally, the attributes of deity belong equally to each person of the Godhead. And I'll give you a couple, uh, at least a couple of examples, and we'll talk about more, but uh, because all of them would apply, certainly. The attributes of deity belong equally to each person of the Godhead. For example, let's talk about the eternality of God. The fact that God is from everlasting to everlasting. The fact that God is eternal. And uh, <clears throat> I'll give you some references here. Uh, eternality. The eternality of the Father. I'm not going to take time to turn to these for the sake of time, but let me give you the references, and you can look them up on your own if you want to. Uh, the eternality of the Father is stated in Psalm chapter 90 and verse 2. And again, I'm not necessarily saying this is the only place you'll find this, but this is where you will find it in this particular reference. The eternality of the Father is stated in Psalm chapter 90 and verse 2. The eternality of the Son is uh, found in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8. Revel Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 in reference to the eternality of the Lord Jesus and of the Holy Spirit in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. All right, uh, so that's one example. I'll give you another one. I'm going to ask you for at least two of these come test time, I'm sure. So, so at least get these first two down, and we'll talk about some others in general terms here. Uh, how about omniscience? Omniscience for our second example. The omniscience of the Father is, is spoken of, of course, in, in, uh, in many places, but here's one reference for you. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10. The omniscience of the Father is given in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10. Uh, the omniscience of the Son, John chapter 17 and verse 25. John chapter 17, verse 25. Um, the omniscience of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 
and as I said, that's just two examples. There are all the other attributes, of course, belong also to each of the persons of the Godhead uh, in equal fashion. And uh, both Testaments, Old and New, declare that all that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit possess all the attributes of, of deity. Uh, and, and, you know, there's just two examples, but we can enlarge upon that. Certainly, each is eternal. Each is omnipotent. Each is omniscient. Each is omnipresent. Certainly, each is holy. And uh, I've given you several of those. Let me expand upon a couple more of those if you want some more examples for your notes. We've already talked about eternality and what was it, omniscience? All right, let's put down omnipotence. Omnipotence. And I don't have these detailed as far as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I just have the references here, so let me give them to you. Omnipotence. 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter 1.5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. And also Romans chapter 15 and verse number 19. Romans 15, 19. Um, let's see, we did omniscience. Okay, omnipresence. Each is omnipresent. And I'll give you some references on that one. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. Jeremiah 23, 24. Um, Matthew 18, 20. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. And the last one would be Psalm 139 and verse 7. Psalm 139, verse 7. And also, of course, holiness. Each of the, each of the persons of the Godhead, of course, are, are God. Each are holy. Uh, references Revelation 15 4 Revelation 15 4 also Acts chapter 1 verse 5 Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and the third one also from the book of Acts Acts chapter 3 and verse 14 Acts chapter 3 and verse 14 so again uh, just a, a summary statement there on that thought that the other attributes, all the attributes belong to each of the persons of the Godhead because each person of the Trinity is co-equal with each other. All right, that brings me to the Old Testament passages now and uh, this would be subpoint B in your, in your outline if you're keeping it uh, in that way. The Old Testament teaches that God is one, put this statement down, uh, the Old Testament teaches that God is one, capital O, one in three persons. God is one in three persons. Now I'm going to give you, uh, looks like about six, maybe seven references here. And uh, we're just going to touch on maybe the first one here this morning in our last few minutes. But I'll give you uh, at least six or seven or eight or so uh, references from the Old Testament that speak, of course, of the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, and I'll probably hold you accountable for some of this come test time, at least three or four of them anyway. But uh, let's go back to the beginning, amen? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that's the first one on your list. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we've probably dealt with this thought before, uh, perhaps in this class and certainly some other classes. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, the Hebrew uh, name, the Hebrew word uh, for God used in this particular account, uh, as you probably already know, is the name Elohim. All right, put that down. The Hebrew word for God here is Elohim. This is, uh, in fact, let me give you several things to write down here, and this is about what we're going to have to wind up with here this morning. All right, starting with number one, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The Hebrew word for God is, here is Elohim. The Hebrew word for God here in this reference is Elohim. All right, next statement. This is a plural noun. This is a plural noun. Say, so what's that talking about? This teaches that there is one, here's the point. This teaches that there is one God in a plurality of persons. 
This teaches that there is one God, not many gods, but one God in a plurality of persons. This teaches that there is one God in a plurality of persons. All right, the last part of the statement is this. Elohim, as used in reference to the one true God, Elohim, as used in reference to the one true God, does not mean gods, plural gods, does not mean gods, but refers to God in his threefold being. Elohim, as used in reference to the one true God, does not mean gods, but refers to God in his threefold being. Elohim, as used in reference to the one true God, does not mean gods, but refers to God in his threefold being. Being. All right, we've got time for the second one. Number two on your list, right here in the same chapter, verse number 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Here, of course, we, we're dealing with the creation account. Verse number 26, and God said, let us make man, emphasis on the pronoun there us let us make man in our image after our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea that's one of my favorite statements in all the bible let them have dominion over the fish of the sea man <laughs> i share these precious passages with my game warden son-in-law every now and then you know but uh all right let us make man in our image our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. All right, now here's what I want you to get down here. Genesis 1:26. Again, God, write it down, again, God is spoken of as plural in the account of creation. Again, God is spoken of as plural in the account of of creation. Here we see the use of a plural pronoun. Write it down. Here we see the use of a plural pronoun uh, used of God. In fact, we see it twice in that verse. The word us and the word our. <clears throat> Here we see the use of a plural pronoun used of God. God said, let us. Who's he talking to? It's God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit. That's who he's talking to. Now, some folks would say, well, he's talking to the angels. Well, the angels weren't made in God's image. Man was. Amen? And uh, after our likeness, the Scripture says. Now, we're going we're gonna to detail a number of other verses. I'm going to have to stop right there for the sake of time. But we're going to find the use of plural pronouns in reference to God in other places as well as we continue this discussion. We'll cut it off there. Wednesday, right after our memory work, we'll jump back into this and uh, continue our, our thoughts here concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. All right, thank you. You are dismissed.